gang. I'm Gene Shepard, and uh, I'm about to read a short story to you. This is a short story that's actually a chapter out of Wanda Hickey's Night of Golden Memories and Other Disasters, which was published by Doubleday and Dolphin Press. Uh, This short story, by the way, originally appeared in Playboy and was a Humor Satire Award winner for that year. Uh, It was voted as one of the funniest stories of the year in Playboy. All right, Uh, the name of the story is Scott Farkas and the Murderous Mariah. I'm going to throw this wagon out, George. You just don't play with it anymore. You're a general now. It's just gathering dust in the cellar. And if you don't want that little hatchet you got for your birthday, I'm going to get rid of that, too. I don't want it just banging around the house. It's liable to cause more trouble. I'm hearing George Washington's mother speaking in a quavery, old-timey voice, filtering through the hazy mists of past ages. There, in the case, right in front of my eyes, was a stylish, archaic, hunched-up kind of cart with big spoked wheels. You could even see the vestigial flecks of ancient red paint. And the card read, Toy Wagon generally supposed to have belonged to George Washington as a child. This priceless relic has been almost conclusively authenticated. George Washington's little red wagon. My mind boggled at the thought of our father of the country tugging his high-spoked wooden toy through the boondocks, his 18th-century overalls faintly damp, his 18th-century kid shoes trailing laces in the sand on his way to becoming the most successful revolutionist in all history. Hmm. I moved among the museum exhibits, now deep in a maelstrom of contemplation, mining a new vein of thought that had never occurred to me. In the next case, resting on a chaste, velvet-covered podium, lay a chewed and worn wooden top of the type commonly known among wooden top set of my day as a spikesy. For the unfortunates unfamiliar with this maddening device, which over the centuries has separated the men from the boys among kids, a spikesy is a highly functional, top-shaped wooden toy, beautifully malevolently tapered down to a glittering steel spike-like spinning surface, a point. I stopped dead in my tracks, unable to believe my eyes. I looked hard and long, peering intently into the shiny glass case at the squat toy that was displayed there. There was no doubt about it. This was no ordinary spikesy, but identical with a sinister breed of top that I myself had once encountered. Bending low over the exhibit, I examined the inscription. Unusual handmade top. Origin unknown. Said to have been owned by the young Thomas Jefferson. My God! Thomas Jefferson's top! The elegant, consummate product of the age of reason, Thomas Jefferson, architect, statesman, utopian, man of letters. I wondered modestly whether I could have shown Tom a thing or two about top spinning myself. (laughs) After all, a declaration of independence is one thing. A split top is another. The top rested quietly on its podium, mute, mysterious. It was a dark, rich, worn, russet color. I wondered what its name was, and what battles it had fought for the framer of the American way of life, what battles it had fought in the distant past, and would perhaps fight again. As I gazed at the top, old spike wounds itched vaguely beneath my tapered Italian slacks. Old wounds I had sustained in hand-to-hand spike sea combat with antagonists of the dim past. Well did I remember Junior Kissel's economical slicing sidearm movement, his green top string snapping curtly as he laid his yellow spikesy down right on a dime with a hissing whir. Flick, on the other hand, more erratic, more flamboyant, had a tendency to loft his spikesy, releasing it after a showy looping overhead motion a good two feet above the surface of the playing field. His top spun with an exhibitionistic, wobbling playfulness, and usually bounced hesitantly two or three times before settling into the groove. Now I, 
Yeah, I myself preferred a sneaky, snake-like underhand movement, beginning at the hip, swinging down to around the knees, upward slightly, and then the quick release after a fast whip-like follow-through. Flick was great to watch. Kissel, methodical and clean. I was deadly. In my day, there were two types of top spinners, those who merely played with a top, dilettantes, haphazard, sloppy, beneath notice, and those to whom a top was a weapon in the purest, purest sense, an extension of the will, an instrument of talent and aggression, anything but a toy. I was one of that lonely breed. In combat, the top was used for only one thing, destruction. A top in the sweaty, tense hand of a real artist was capable of splitting his rival's top down the middle in the flickering of an eyelash. Oh, I remember all too well the sinking sensation of total defeat when my first top skittered into the gutter, wobbling crazily like a drunken thing in two distinct and irrevocable halves. <laughs> and Scott Farkas parketing his sleek, ugly, black spikes he strode away without as much as a backward glance. Then and there, the course of the next few years of my festering life was uncompromisingly set. In the secrecy of the basement, hour after hour, I clandestinely practiced every known motion, ranging from the rarely seen, difficult-to-master whiplash to the effete, delicate sidearm slice. Slowly, my own true personal form began to emerge, until one spring day, in five minutes, I had halved the prized possessions of three of my closest friends. I knew then I was ready for the big time. Not quite. True, as a performer, I felt fairly confident. It was the top itself that I lacked. To the untutored eye, I suppose, a top is a top. Some red, some green, some blue. <laughs> I find this hard to believe, but no doubt this is so to some. Ignorance may be bliss, but it is also pitiable. To the uninformed, all bats used by ball players look alike. <laughs> this could not be further from the truth. Major leaguers make annual treks to Louisville, Kentucky, for the sole and express purpose of selecting the seasoned lumber, the delicate taper, the precise finish, and exquisitely calculated weight of the one thing that stands between them and anonymity. They guard their personal weapons with a fierce and unremitting jealousy. Long winter evenings are spent by the big leaguers, internationally known sluggers, resting before the fireside, carefully, endlessly rubbing next season's lumber with oily pork chop bones, until finally, by opening day, the clean-up man steps to the plate, whipping through the ambient air a personal and completely assimilated fusion of man and device. Boog Powell's bat, do you remember Boog Powell, is as different from, say, uh, oh, uh, Tony Canigliero, who was a contemporary, as twilight is from dawn. They may look alike to the uninitiated, but they don't feel the same. Scott Farkas's top, known throughout the neighborhood as Mariah, had at least 50 or more confirmed kills to its credit as well as a half-dozen probables and God knows how many disabling gashes and wounds. Rumor held that this top had been owned by Farkas's father before him, a silent, steely-eyed, blue-jawed man who spoke with a thick, guttural accent. He ran a junkyard, piled high with rotting hulks of deceased automobiles and rusting railroad train wheels. Some said that it wasn't a top at all, but some kind of foreign knife and not large as tops go, it was a peculiarly squat shape, a kind of small, stunted, pitch-black mushroom, wider above than most, and tapering them off quickly to a dark blue, case-hardened, glittering saber tip. Not only was the top strange in appearance, it spun with a low, mean humming, a truly distinctive, ominous note, a note that rose and fell, deep and rumbling, like the sound of an approaching squadron of distant folkers, bent on death and destruction. Farkas, like all true professionals, rarely showed his top, unless in anger. Skulking about the playground, his back pocket bulging meaningfully, just the trace of top string showing, Farkas was a continual walking, living, 
surly challenge. As a marble player, he had long since been barred from any civilized games. His persistent use of blue steel ball bearings, lightly polished with three-in-one oil, had reduced our feisty and tiny little angry games to shambles, leaving the playground strewn with the wreckage of shattered comsies, precious aggies, and blasted hopes. Farkas played for keeps, in the truest sense of the word. An aggie, belted by one of Farkas's cannonballs, ceased to exist, dissolving in a quick puff of pulverized ash. Farkas's secret was not in his choice of weapons alone. He had the evil eye. We have all seen this eye at one time or another in our lives, glimpsed fleetingly, perhaps, for a terrifying, paralyzing moment on the subway, among a jostling throng on the sidewalk, in the midst of a riotous Saturday night, or peering from the gloom through the bars of a death house cell in a B-movie at the Orpheum, or through the steamy, aromatic air of the reptile house. It's not easy to describe the effect that Farkas's eye had on the playground of the Warren G. Harding School. I know that such a thing is anatomically not possible, but Farkas's eye seemed to be of the purest silver gray, totally unblinking and glowing from within, with a kind of gem-like hardness. These eyes set in his narrow, high-cheekbone weasel face above a sharp, runny nose have scarred whatever the tender psyches of countless pre-adolescents had or possessed. Many's the kid who awakened screaming, drenched with cold sweat in the dead of night, dreaming wild nightmares of being chased over fences, under porches, through garages by that remorseless weasel face. The closest thing I've ever seen to the general quality, both physical and spiritual, of Scott Farkas came to me on a sunny afternoon on a Florida dock. I came face to face with a not-quite-deceased eight-foot mako shark. Scott Farkas at ten was a man night to be trifled with. In fact, he was the only kid I ever heard of who rarely smoked cigars, cigarettes, or corn silk. Farkas chewed apple-cured red mule cut plug, in class and out. And as a spitter, Farkas unquestionably stands among the all-time greats. During class, he generally used the inkwell as a target, while on the playground he usually preferred someone else's hair. Few dared to protest, and those who did lived to regret it. Farkas's glance, boring gun hard across the classroom, carried a message to every male in the class, save one, at one time or another. It read, I'll get you after school. The kid, knowing he was doomed, often wet his pants right there or then. He'd never been known to refer to any of his classmates by other than their last name only. The use of the first name somehow would have been a sign of camaraderie or weakness and would have undermined his position as an unbending belligerent. The victim's last name was always followed by the same phrase, "'You chicken bastard!' His only known rival in pure thuggishness was the equally infamous Grover Dill. The two had formed an unspoken alliance, each recognizing the other as extremely dangerous, an alliance that held the rest of the kids in total subjugation. As a competitive top spinner, Farkas was universally recognized as unbeatable. You just didn't beat him. The combination of Mariah and Farkas's short, whistling three-quarter lash movement was devastating. He sacrificed accuracy for sheer power, like a fastball pitcher with a streak of wildness. When Mariah hit, there was no return. Occasionally a challenger, getting wind of Farkas's overpowering reputation at Warren G. Harding, would show up at recess time from some foreign school. A ripple of excitement would move quickly through the motley throng as the two battlers squared off. There's a strong streak of chauvinism among the Warren G. Harding students. It could be said that we felt Warren G. Harding right or wrong except when Scott Farkas was facing down a challenger from, say, St. Peter's Parochial School or George Rogers Clark. Farkas did not carry the colors of Warren G. Harding on his back. Like all true outlaws, the only color he recognized was blood red. The other guys, of course. Week after week, month after month, we stood by helplessly as Scott Farkas and Mariah made wreckage of the best tops in Holman, Indiana, 
Not only that, we were forced by a single scythe-like sweep of his evil eye to applaud his victories. This was the unkindest cut of all. I remembered the hated words rattling in my throat as I banged Flick on his back. Ha, <laughs> ha, old Farkas, you're dead at this time. Ha, <laughs> ha, old Farkas. Flick hollowly answering, yeah. Pocketing Mariah and hawking fiercely, spitting majestically, Farkas would swagger sideways into the gloom of the boys' bathroom to look for somebody to hit. Another notch was added to his already well-notched belt. This was the nature of my enemy, as I practiced day after day in the basement next to the furnace, perfecting, honing, polishing my burgeoning technique. Why I did it, I cannot tell. Some men are driven to climb Everest. Others go over Niagara Falls in barrels or beach balls. Some try to date Ursula Andrus. Others are driven to wrestle crocodiles barehanded. I only knew that in the end there would be just Farkas and me and our tops. One thing was sure. To get hold of a top that could even stay in the same ring with Mariah, I would have to do better than the measly assortment that old man Pulaski kept in the candy case among the jawbreakers, the juju babies, and the wax teeth. Pulaski's tops were not fighting tops. They were little kid playing around tops, weak, defenseless, wobbly, minnow-like. They were even used by girls. Do you have any other tops but them little ones? Do you want a top or don't you? Old man Pulaski glared down at me from behind his bloody butcher's apron while the jostling knot of Lithuanian and Polish housewives clamored for soup bones. Yeah, but I got that kind. Here, how about a nice red one? He reached into the case, trying to hurry the sale. You got any black ones? Oh, for Christ's sake, black tops. Come on, kid, I ain't got time to fool around. You want a top or not, huh? Scott Farkas got one. I told Scott Farkas if he ever come in here again, I'd kick his behind. He didn't get no black top here. Well, he's got one. Well, why'd you ask him where he got it? He roared off back to the meat counter. Pulaski was a man who was always in a hurry. Obviously, that was out of the question. Asking Farkas where he got Maria was about like asking King Kong where he got his fangs. So I began methodically to visit candy stores, dime stores, toy stores, any kind of store where they might conceivably have tops. Every day on my paper route, I sniffed and I hunted. From time to time, I even bought what looked like a promising challenger, but I knew deep down in my heart that none of them came close to Mariah. Some were better than Pulaski's, some worse. I even discovered all sorts of tricky little frilly tops I'd never even before seen or heard of. This went on well through spring. Then, late one balmy day, slowly pedaling home on my Elgin bicycle, the pride of my life, its foxtails hanging limply in the soft air, my mind a good eight, maybe ten light years away, I came unexpectedly to the end of my search. I was at least four miles beyond my usual range in a run-down rickety tenement section of town near the roundhouse. The steady crash and roar of switch engines, the shrieking and booming of Monon freight cars went on twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week in this country. Even when the sun was out brightly, the skies here were gray. I barely ever got over this far. It was rare. It was foreign territory. I pedaled aimlessly along the dingy, dark street, the curbs lined with elderly, disreputable automobiles, reading signs as I went. For the first few years after you learn to read, you read everything in sight carefully. Beech nut tobacco. Bull Durham. Fisk tires. Room for rent. Railroaders welcome. Commit no nuisance on this property. Chili parlor, hot tamales, shoe shine, barber shop, snooker, pool, total victory newsstand and notions, lump coal sold here by the pound. Wait a minute. Total victory newsstand and notions. It was a tiny, dark sliver of a shop wedged in between two gloomy red brick buildings about the size of those places where a man sells celluloid combs and hunches over a lathe making keys. I swung over to the curb, squeaked on the brakes, 
and dropped the bike in front of a derelict Hudson Terraplane in front of the total victory. A faded red metal slotted newspaper display case leaned against a locked Coca-Cola icebox. The window of the store was impenetrable by human gaze, covered with a rich dust and fine essence, a dark patina of locomotive smoke and the essence of Sinclair oil from the nearby refineries. Faded posters hawking Copenhagen snuff, sweet ore work gloves, and lava soap, the mechanic's friend, completed the job. For a second or two, once inside, I couldn't see a thing. It was so dark and dingy. What do you want, honey? I peered around the high glass case containing stacks of snuff boxes and tablets looking for the speaker. What do you want? An ancient lady wearing a black shawl over her head, the way most Polish ladies did in our neighborhood, stared piercingly at me. Uh, uh, you want some orange pop, Sonny? She spoke with the slightest trace of a European accent. You got any tops? Why, yes, Sonny, yes, we do. She disappeared behind the counter for a long moment. The shop's air was heavy with the scent of garlic, cabbage, tobacco juice, and old clothes. Outside, a diesel engine blatted its horn thunderingly and rumbled off into the middle distance. How about these, Sonny? She hoisted a cardboard box of tops onto the counter. I might have known it. She must have got these tops from the same place Pulaski got his. Oh, weak-kneed trifles that you saw everywhere, the same old junk that Pulaski sold. Uh, is that all you got? How about a red one, Sonny? Uh, you, you got any other kind? Other kind? These are good tops, Sonny. Nah, I got one of them. Bye. I started to leave, as I had done so many other times in the past, from every other dinky candy store in town. And just as I got to the door, Ah, uh, Sonny, Sonny, would you come back here? Vaguely uneasy, I turned one foot out on the sidewalk, the other on the greasy floor, my kids ready to spring for the Elgin. She had disappeared into the back of the store behind a beaded curtain. She reemerged into the murky gloom, carrying a cardboard Quaker oats can. She set it down on the counter and began fishing in it with withered claws. I waited, figuring she was going to spring a yo-yo on me, a toy for boobs and idiots, a sop for the untalented. She pulled out a tangled mass of rubber band string and a couple of old clothespins with what looked like a dead mouse. A switch engine bellowed asthmatically in the ambient air outside, followed by a muffled curse from the brakeman. Aha! Here she is! She fished scratchingly, unable to grab whatever it was at the bottom of the can. I wouldn't sell this top to everybody, Sonny. Yeah, I was ready to jump. But I can tell that you need a top, Sonny, she cackled, her faint white beard glinting dully. Her hand snaked out of the can, clutching something round. Great Scott! Cradled in her talons lay a malevolent duplicate of Scott Farkas's evil Mariah. A duplicate in everything, spirit, confirmation, size, everything, except the color. It was a dull, burnished, scuffed, silvery pewter, a color I had never seen on a top before. But then, except for Mariah, I had never seen a black one either. It's been used, so it won't cost you much, Sonny. How much? I was almost afraid to ask. How much? Oh, I'd say ten cents, Sonny. It's imported. She's a gypsy top. I was in. It was one of the few moments when I was well-heeled, carrying a full twelve cents in my jeans, I forked over my two nickels as calmly as I could and took possession of what was to prove to be a historic find. I had at last come together with the greatest fighting top I'd ever seen. It had an oily, heavy, solid feel, a nice, comfortable heft like, oh, like a, a Colt Snub Detective 38 Special feels in the hand. I'd already decided to call it Wolf. Good luck, Sonny. Careful. She's a mean one. Outside, the switchyard mumbled and muttered, 
as a long, clattering string of flatbeds rumbled toward the steel mill. With Wolf safely in my hip pocket, I pedaled furiously through the twilight toward Cleveland Street. The showdown had begun. I knew it. And somewhere in his lair, someplace, Scott Farkas must have known it, too. That night, after supper, under a dim yellow light bulb in the basement next to the looming furnace that dominated the underworld below our house, I carefully wound my best top string around Wolf for the first time, pulling each loop hard and tight so that it lay flat against the preceding one until finally Wolf was cocked and ready for action. The string itself is highly important to a genuine expert. I preferred the hard, green, twisted cord that knotted solidly and got a good bite on the side of the top. This type of string, incidentally, is not easy to use, but once the technique is mastered, nothing could come near it. I had long since outgrown the standard wooden button for the end of the string, using instead a thin, one-inch mother-of-pearl button stolen from my mother's sewing basket. There were three extras stashed away in my dresser drawer for emergencies. As the dim bulb illuminated a faint circle on the gray concrete floor, I scratched a mark in the exact center of the pool of light for a target and stepped back into the almost full darkness. I could smell the moldering old tires that my father kept hanging on the walls just in case someday he might pick up another hupmobile and the mildewed Sunday papers of years back that lay piled against the concrete block walls and the scent of countless generations of field mice who had lived out their lives in this basement and the dusty mason jars filled with grape jelly and strawberry preserves that lined the plank shelves under the steps and the sharp rubber smell, bitter and strong, of the coiled garden hose under the workbench and the more subtle but pervasive aroma of a half-ton of damp, soft coal in the pitch-black coal bin, all held together with the soapy dankness of the drains, covered with perforated iron lids that every week carried the family's used wash water back into Lake Michigan. Deliberately and meticulously, I set Wolf down on the concrete floor for the first time. Ah, oh, we were made for each other. Just the way Mariah was made for Scott. The personality of Tops, you know, is an odd thing. Mariah spun with an angry ferocity, a carnivorous drive that was despised and feared by everyone who had had the bad luck to see it in action. Wolf, on the other hand, my Top, was steadier, giving off a note higher in pitch than Mariah, but in some ways even more deadly. Mariah was a hot-blooded animal. Wolf, cold-blooded, snake-like. It would be an interesting meeting. Again, I laid the top precisely on the mark I had made, getting the feel of it, gradually letting myself out, feeling the full flush of rising excitement and mounting confidence as I gradually mastered the sinister wolf. Even from the start, however, I had the sneaky, uneasy feeling that somehow I didn't really own this top. At first, I felt that it was just because I was not used to it, little suspecting how right I was. For two weeks, every night, Wolf and I practiced together in the basement. I had decided not to show him to anyone until we would take on Farkas. No telling what would have happened if Farkas had heard of the existence of Wolf and my plans before I was ready to really give him battle. Even at that, I knew very well that my chances of breaking even with Farkas, let alone defeating him, were slim as the chances of that proverbial snowball in hell. In public, I began throwing my weight around with second string tops until the word slowly began to spread throughout the gym, the auditorium, the homerooms, until at recess time I could always draw a small clack of fans goading me on to belt some poor kid's top into the boondocks. Since the day Farkas had publicly humiliated me, he no longer even deigned to note my top work. Once, however, he paused briefly, while twisting Jack Robertson's arm behind him and belting him in the ribs with his free hand to spit a thin spray of tobacco juice over my orange top, which had landed neatly beside Delbert Bumpus's yellow ball bearing spinner. He might have taken me on right then and there, but he was busy giving Robinson his refresher course. Periodically, Farkas treated every kid in the class to a good, brisk, tendon-snapping arm twist. He shoved the victim's 
wrist up between his shoulder blades, pushing up and twisting out until the supplicant's face turned ash and his eyes bugged out and his tongue lolled in agony, Farkas yelling, Come on, you son of a bitch, say it! You bastard, say it! Ah, 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 come on, say it, you son of a bitch! Farkas gives him two more degrees of twist and brings his knee smartly into contact with the tailbone of the sufferer. I said, say it! The victim, looking piteously at the ring of silent, scornful watchers, his ex-friends, including, no doubt, his ex-girlfriend, finally squeaked out, I, uh, I'm a chicken bastard! Say it again, louder, louder, you bastard! Say it again! I'm a chicken bastard! Oh! With that, Farkas hurled his pain-wracked body violently into the stickers. Give me a cigarette, Dill. And the two of them would go skulking off toward the pool room. He gave this refresher course about every six months to all of us. We figured he kept a list and checked us off when our time came. It was Friday. I knew that today would be the day. Somehow you know those things. It had rained all night, a hard, driving, Midwestern, drenching downpour. Now, as I toyed with my Wheaties, I could feel the edge of danger mounting within me. Will you listen to me? I'm talking to you. Uh, a what? When I'm talking to you, I want you to listen. You sit there like you got potatoes in your ears. My mother always had a thing about not listening. Also about dragging your feet. That drove her crazy. She always yelled that I didn't walk straight either. How many times have I told you not to slump like that when you're eating? It isn't good for your stomach. I scrunched around in my chair, pretending I was listening to her. You better be home early this afternoon because you've got to go to the store. I don't want to have to tell you again. Yeah, yeah. How many times have I told you not to say yeah? Yeah. This went on for about three hours or so until I finally got out of the house with Wolf stuck down deep in my hip pocket with two other lesser tops in my front right side pocket. I was loaded for bear. It looked like rain as I walked through the alleys, over the fences, through the vacant lots on my way to the playground, kicking sheets of water up from muddy puddles, skipping bottle caps into new lakes as I moved toward the battlefield. A few other kids drifted in the same direction from the next block. The trees dripping warm water under a low, gray, ragged clouds. Off to the north, towards Lake Michigan, even though it was full daytime, the steel mills glowed dark red against the old the low, hanging overcast. At last, on the playground, I began my carefully thought-out scheme. Hey, uh, Kissel, how about a little action? My top, the second-string orange one, whistled out and landed with a click on the asphalt. How about a Kissel? I scooped up the top, this time laying her down on one of the school steps, making it walk downstairs a step at a time. A neat trick from my basic repertoire. Finally, goaded, Kissel pulled out of his pocket his lumpy little green top. Oh, come on, I won't split it, Kissel. Just nick it a little. Don't worry, come on. A few onlookers had drifted into range, sensing something important afoot. I was deliberately overplaying my hand. I'll let, I'll let, even let you go first, Kissel. Right, come on, come on, chicken. I spun my top temptingly in front of Kissel's Indian tread tennis shoes, he couldn't resist any longer. He bit hard. All right, smart guy, he said. Take that. His green top narrowly missed mine, bouncing on the asphalt and then settling down into its pedestrian buzz. Quickly, I scooped up my top, wound it up, and let him have it. His green toy careened drunkenly into the gutter. Sorry, Kissel, I just couldn't control it. I put my top bag in my pocket, saying loudly, There's no good top man around here. No good top men around here anyway. Come on, let's play some softball. I had made sure that before any of this happened, Grover Dill was in the throng. I knew only one thing could happen after an outrageous remark like that. Even now, his sloping shoulders, his thick neck, his ragged crew cut were disappearing in the direction of the alley behind the school where he and Farkas smoked cigars, chewed tobacco, hatched plots, and went over their refresher course checklists. I must admit that I felt no little nervousness at this point, but it was too late to turn back. The die was cast. Nervously, I fished a Tootsie Roll out of my pocket and chewed furiously to cover up. Sure enough, 
Not five minutes had passed. In fact, we were in the middle of choosing up sides for the softball game when a tremendous wallop from behind sent me sprawling into a puddle. Instantly, the mob surged forward. Looking up from the mud, I saw Farkas holding Mariah casually in his left hand while spinning his greasy black top string like a lariat in his right. It whistled faintly. Get up, you chicken bastard. He quickly wound the string around Mariah and flicked it high in the air, catching it on his palm as it came down. She spun efficiently on his hand for a moment before he closed his talons over her. Come on, get up, you punk. Slowly I arose, pretending to be contrite. What's the matter, Farkas? What did I do? Gee whiz! A low snicker went through the multitude. They recognized the signs, the old, familiar, cowardice signs. To a man, they had uttered these words themselves from time to time. They enjoyed others in the trap. Get out, your top, punk. My top? Get it out! A few drops of rain had begun to fall, and it seemed to grow darker by the second. By now the crowd had grown until we were ringed by a motley circle of noncommittal faces. Every kid in the playground was in the crowd. The word was out. Farkas was getting someone. And Farkas demanded an audience. Nervously, I pulled out my poor, doomed orange top. There was no hope for it once Farkas zeroed in his sights. I had carefully planned this sacrifice. We'll flip for firsties, punk, Farkas barked, his eyes cold, Mariah resting at the ready. Flip, Dill, flip, flip, Dill, heads. His crony spun his famous two-headed nickel into the gray air. Heads, you win, Scut. Dill snarled in my direction. You win, Scut. The crowd murmured ominously, but stilled instantly when Farkas glanced quickly around to spot who the wise guys were. Who was laughing here? Spin, jerk! I wound my orange top tightly, dug my feet as hard as I could down into the, into the asphalt. Using my underhand sweep fast and low, I laid her down a good fifteen feet away. Remember, this was my orange top. Farkas half-crouched, Mariah digging into his grimy thumb the rusty metal washer he used for a button, jabbing out from between his fingers. His arm jerked down and out. The string snapped. Black Mariah struck. That is, she missed by less than an inch. The two tops spun side by side for a moment until I darted forward, scooping mine up and backed off. Before me, Black Mariah sat toad-like, growling moodily, while Farkas watched with ill-concealed contempt. I decided to go in for the kill. Again my arm dropped. The orange top streaked out, heading straight for Black Mariah's vitals. It was a good shot. Farkas knew it. He snarled low in his throat. The crowd murmured excitedly as my orange top cracked smartly against Mariah. But it wobbled off weakly among the feet of the onlookers. Mariah did not budge. Spin it again, you chicken bastard. Farkas picked up Mariah and waited for my next move. I knew this was it. I had missed my chance. But then I wasn't counting on this poor, sad little orange top. My big move was on the way. I spun. Then, with his accustomed sardonic ease, the showboat attitude he always displayed, when picking up a scalp, Farkas neatly crapped my top into kingdom come, cracked it right down the middle, the deadly spike sending up a thin spray from the wet pavement. By habit or tradition, the multitude indicated its approval of Scott's victory. Oh, wow! Holy smokes! Gee whiz! Woo-wee! And other sickening sounds. Farkas usually always got this type of applause. He turned and looked at the crowd casually and then picked up Mariah, turned his head back on me, and followed by Dill, they started to walk away, the crowd parting before them. It was now. My hand whipped down into my back pocket, quickly snaked Wolf out into the open, and in the twinkling of a moment I had him wound and instantly laid Wolf down, hard and solid. Its high, thin note, steady as a dentist's drill and twice as nasty, cut through the falling rain and stopped Farkas in his tracks. He turned and stared for a long instant. His eyes seemed to widen. 
and he actually, for a moment at least, appeared to grow pale, but even more baleful, as he recognized Wolf for what it was. Between us, the silver-gray top sang tauntingly. I didn't say a word. Wolf said it all. The crowd, sensing that something had happened, became hushed and tense. Somewhere off in the south, a mutter of thunder rumbled and stilled. Casually, Farkas wound his top string about Mariah, and without a word, laid it down with a hard, vicious overhand, cracking shot that missed Wolf by the thickness of a coat of paint. The two tops spun together with no daylight between, Mariah's bass rumble blending with the shuddering whine of Wolf in an eerie, angry duet. Quickly I picked up Wolf, and this time, with all the force I had, I went in for the big one. A silver-gray streak, Wolf blurred out before me. The crowd gasped audibly. Scut peered sharply down at Mariah as Wolf screamed towards the coup de grace. I couldn't believe it. Moving like a shadow over Mariah, Wolf missed by the thickness of a hair. Instantly, with a cackle, <laughs> Farkas gathered in Mariah and with a guttural laugh sent her down the rails to finish off Wolf. Now, I had seen him really angry at opponents before, but nothing like this. I was afraid to look, half turning away, but the roar of the crowd told me that, incredibly, Mariah had missed. It was my turn now. For once in my life, my nerves were like steel. This time, with deliberate, infinite deliberation, I aimed and carefully let fly a little higher, with more lift, a more deadly trajectory, Wolf rose and came down like a fiend of hell, swooping out of the sky like some gray eagle. But at the last possible instant, it actually seemed to change course in midair, grazing Mariah slightly and skittering off into a puddle. Again and again we attacked each other, first Wolf, then Mariah. Over and over we drove at each other's vitals. Something was happening that slowly began to dawn, first on Farkas and me, and then on the crowd. Incredibly, these two tops seemed to be afraid of each other. Either that, or they were somehow in some way mysteriously jinxed. My arm ached. Farkas paused only to blow his nose on his sleeve before going back to the attack. It was growing darker, and it became obvious to us that at this rate neither of us was going to scalp the other. The two insane tops, grimy, covered with mud, leaped like live things, ricocheting, leapfrogging, hovering over each other, behaving in a way that no top before or since has ever acted. They hated each other, yet they seemed to be in league. Dill, like all good toadies, tried everything he could to snaffle Wolf, kicking up mud when I spun, going even to the extent of nudging me violently on two occasions, hoping to tip the balance. Farkas was game but growing angrier and fiercer by the second, until finally he grabbed Mariah up from the scratched and scarred battlefield, looked at me with a long, searing gaze of hate, and finally he said in a low voice, Okay, you chicken yellow bastard, let's play keepers. Keepers. Keepers meant that one kid could own both these tops. If his top could drive the other one out of a circle made on the concrete with chalk, it was the final test of topping. Farkas was gambling Mariah against Wolf. Dill quickly drew a lopsided circle in the cement concrete that paralleled the asphalt. The hard surface was perfect for keepers. You go first, Farkas commanded. Under the rules of the game, you were not allowed to strike your opponent's top directly, so it really didn't matter who went first in this game. The tops themselves fought it out, walking each other around the circle until one or the other was pushed out. I spun Wolf, little realizing, for the last time. It whistled out in a low arc, landing fair in the center of the circle. I put as much power on the spin itself as I could, cracking the string with a hard, flat snap. Wolf spun, waiting for Mariah, its spike ringing sharp and hard. Farkas spun Mariah, and the two tops hummed within an inch of each other. Slowly they walked closer and closer as the crowd closed in, closer and even closer. And then finally, tick, 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 they were touching, locked in mortal combat, first Wolf, then Mariah. 
then Mariah, and then Wolf, ticking, humming, in rising and falling cadence as they edged toward the dreaded line, which would go out first. For a few moments it seemed as though Wolf was doomed, and then, righting itself, it shouldered Mariah closer to the line. Impossibly, the two seemed to pick up speed as they spun. Angrier and angrier they grew, until suddenly, with a lunge, the two tops smashed together head-on, both reeling in tandem in a mad, locked, spinning embrace, together at one one move over the line and out of the circle. The rain, falling steadily, pattered down on the two hazy forms in the misty air. Farkas, sensing victory, shouted, "'Yours is out, you bum!' He darted forward. The two tops continued to struggle together as they toppled over the curb into the gutter, clicking, snapping, snarling crazily in the fast-running water, sending up sharp rooster tails of muddy foam. I moved as fast as I could to defend Wolf. Suddenly, it was all over. The two tops, locked in mortal combat, disappeared down a sewer from which rose a deep roar of rushing water. They were gone. Never before had any of us seen Tops behave like this. Farkas, his face white, his eyes glazed, stared down into the raging flood through the grill of the drain. And then without a word, he rose, and followed by Dill, walked off down the street in the rain. I knew I would never see Wolf again. But somehow I knew that neither Wolf nor Mariah were finished. These two tops would go on. I don't know why I knew this, but I did, and I still know it. They're still fighting somewhere. The crowd broke up into small knots. The great top days were over at Warren G. Harding's school. A few weeks later, I rode over to the other side of town, looking for the Total Victory newspaper and notion shop. One time, months later, I thought I saw it, but it turned out to be a place where they sold stuffed animals and rocking chairs. Off and on, for a while, I continued my search, but I never found it again. <laughs>